Here are 10 top tips for Affinity Photo. I use these in my own work and find them very useful. I hope you do too. Tip number one, how to turn an image into a mask. Okay, so now I'm going to show you how it's done. It's really very simple. We'll use this icon to create a new pixel layer, like so, to hold our image. Now just grab ourselves a brush. I'll have 100% opacity, uh, quite hard for this one. A nice strong flow. I'll select white, though it doesn't need to be white. And draw anything we like on our new pixel layer. Nice blob and some lines. Then all we have to do to turn it into a mask is to grab it like so and place it on top of our underlying image. And there it is. Where we drew is data and where we didn't draw it, there is no data so it's transparent. And that is how to quickly turn an image into a mask. Tip number two, how to turn something else into a mask. You can actually turn other things into masks, such as shapes. Let's have a go. We'll create a background. We'll just create a fill layer, which we'll drag to the bottom underneath our background so that it appears behind the scene when we create the mask. And then making sure we have our background selected. Let's select the text tool place our text and drag it to the required size. Now just type a word, any old word will do. I've no idea why this one is coming to mind. Select our move tool and position it in the center using the guides. Just zoom out a little and holding control, shrink our word to fit the screen. Right, we have our word, so just control zero to fill the screen with the image. Now all we have to do is grab our text layer and place it on our background layer. And just like magic, our text instantly becomes a mask. We can see our background shining through the letters. How useful is that? You can do this with squares, circles, any shape, any text. It is really, really useful. Tip number three, using Merge Visible to increase performance. Here I have a background and I have a couple of heavy denoise filters applied to this background. They have a lot of work to do. If I turn this group on then you can see it takes a while for the denoise filters to perform their calculations and to display things properly. Now if I create another filter above this, maybe a spherical filter, then set the intensity to maximum and type here to set the radius to 2048 then as you can see it takes a while for it to draw and moving this sphere around is very slow and laborious because it's having to do the calculations of all the layers underneath in real time including the denoise which is a processor intensive so it is slow but if we turn off the spherical filter and right click our group and select merge visible to create a merged visible layer referred to as a stamp layer in Photoshop and then wait for a long time but never fear time warp is here and the power of video editing just speeds up time right now we have our new merge layer so if we just turn off the group and turn off our background we still have our merged pixel layer, which is everything underneath merged into a single layer. If we turn our spherical filter back on and click it to re-enable the controls, now when we move our sphere, you can see it's moving much, much more quickly because it's not having to recalculate everything underneath. This also works with any other operation going forward. Any operation you add now will perform more quickly because it's not having to perform calculations on the underlying layers because they're turned off. Tip number four, alternative controls for motion blur. Here we have an image and we have our background layer selected. All we do now is go to filters and blur and select motion blur. Normally we can only go up to 100 on the control panel. That would be our maximum radius and then the rotation we would have to do separately. We can't do them at the same time. But if we just 
click on the image and drag, like so, then we can have a larger radius than the slider allows. A maximum of 1024. And we can rotate it too at the same time. Just like this, we can change the direction. I think you'll find it much more convenient and more visual. Easier to do, easier to see what's going on. As the whole thing is happening in real time. Brilliant. Tip number five, open raw files from new cameras. Here we go. Let's open a raw file from the newly released Fuji X-T3. File and open. Select the Fujifilm rough file. Affinity Photo is now attempting to open a RAW file from a Fujifilm X-T3 camera. When the X-T3 was first released, Photoshop or Lightroom could not open these files, but Affinity Photo could. So if you do have a new camera and Lightroom or Photoshop won't open the files, it's really worth checking to see if Affinity Photo can. It may just be able to. And there we go. Affinity Photo has managed to open a RAW file from a Fuji X-T3. Now there hasn't been an update to Affinity Photo, it always has been able to do it. Another reason that Affinity Photo really is a great piece of software. Number 6. Placing Files You might be surprised at what you can actually place into your document. Choose File and then Place. And this time select a JPEG. In a few seconds, it will have processed the file and it will place it into its own layer in the document. Once it's loaded, we can left click to place and then just drag the image to the size we require. Now, it doesn't only work with JPEGs, it also works with file and place. It works with Affinity Photo project files. Here's one here, we'll just select it. Then just wait for it to be ready and eventually, once the cursor has a little down facing arrow on it, we can place and drag and use the image however we like. What a pretty doggy. So you see it's embedded the whole document with all its layers into a single layer in the layer stack. But here's the magic, you can actually use the place command to import and place directly into your project Photoshop files, here is one. Let's just select it, like so, and wait for the arrow to appear next to the cursor. Here we go. Place it into the document, just like that. There it is. A complete Photoshop file in its own layer within our document. Fantastic. And number seven, display shortcuts. Here I have a nice little picture of my puppy, Jazzy, that I took with my trusty A6000 and just the kit lens. Normally if you press control and use the scroll wheel, the image will then zoom in and out. So you can set your zoom to any amount you like, but it is very difficult to set it to an exact zoom value when you use the scroll wheel. But there is a nice shortcut. So if you want one to one, just hold control and press one on your keyboard. Now one pixel on the source image is one pixel for the image on the screen. So now we can view at one to one. And if you look just here, you can see it says 100% one to one. Now if we press control and two, the image becomes two to one, 200%, which means that every pixel in the source image is two pixels on the screen, magnified times two. Now control and three gives you 400% and control and four gives you 800%. So control plus three equals four to one and control plus four equals eight to one. And at any time, if you want to fit the image perfectly onto the screen, just press control and zero. Now our image not only fits on the screen perfectly, but is centered, ready for you to continue editing. Excellent. Number eight, gradients on masks. Here we have a nice little image, a nice little woodland scene, ready for us to play with. 
one I took a while ago of a little glade in the woods. Now, what if we'd like to make a window in the centre, just a circle in the centre with a nice soft edge? We can do it by using a gradient on a mask. It's quite simple. First of all, we create a mask with this little icon here, and then making sure the mask is selected, which it is, we just grab our gradient tool and then select radial from the drop down list. Using the guides, make sure we're in the center. The guides do come in really handy. Then place and drag out and out. Uh, no, let's just uh, drag to the bottom. So we make sure it fills the whole screen. There we have our gradient. So if we make sure the center point is white, and then we make sure the outer point is black, like so. Because it's a mask, white is opaque and black is transparent. And using this little handle here, we can set the fall off of the gradient to make it harder or softer, which will allow us to create the edge softness that we like. Then just to finish it off, we'll add a fill layer from layer fill layer then drag it to the bottom of the stack and set its color to black there we have it using a gradient on a mask we have created a nice soft edged window for our image very nice indeed number nine making a selection from an image right if I create a pixel layer like so. Then select my paintbrush tool and pick any color. Let's pick a nice pretty yellow and draw with it wherever I like. And pick another color and draw with it. I really am an artist. Then I just make sure the layer is selected. Then choose select and selection from layer. Now the selection has been generated from the layer that I just drew on. I can use it just to like a normal selection, make it harder or softer or refine it using the selection refine tools. But for now, we'll just um, do something very simple with it. We'll delete the layer we drew on by using right click and delete and create a brightness and contrast adjustment. Then when we increase the brightness, you can see it's brightened only where we have our selection, which we drew. So all we have to do now is deselect and we're left with our pretty image and pretty bright blobs. Number 10, shadow and highlight detail enhancement. Here we have a pretty little image, but we'd like to make the highlights pop on the roof and the trees and maybe the tops of the flowers. There is a very, very easy and quick way to achieve this. All we have to do is go adjustments and shadows and highlights. And then what you do, instead of bringing the highlights down to recover highlights and the shadows up to recover shadows, we switch them around. What we do is we bring the highlights up. As you can see, when we bring our highlights up, let's just get them to the right place and bring the shadows down. You can see here the shadows are getting darker the shadows in the foliage at the bottom when we move the shadow slider. When we increase our highlights, if you look here in the roof and clouds and the trees are lighter and more detailed. If we take a look off, on, off, on. As you can see, we've increased the detail in the highlights and also increased detail in the shadows without affecting the whole of the image.